Hello! It's been a while since I made a video, I'm really sorry about that. But I wanted to make a video just to let you know, in case you don't follow me on other kinds of social media, that I am in fact teaching a course on the Desert Fathers starting soon, and we just have about, just about a week left to register. So uh, please do um, register, but maybe you're thinking, I'm not sure. Do I want to take a course on the Desert Fathers? Why should I take a course on the Desert Who? Who are the Desert Fathers? And so I'm here to tell you a little about who, bit about who the Desert Fathers are and why you might want to study them with me. So first of all, the Desert Fathers are a movement within Christian asceticism. Um, you can watch my video on what is asceticism. It's like the very first video I ever uploaded. Um, that took place beginning in the fourth century, so in the age of the church fathers at large, right? Those earliest theologians and thinkers um, who helped lay the foundation for all sub subsequent Christian thought. Well, the Desert Fathers are basically the ascetic movement of the age of the fathers. Um, and so they sort of take what there had, there were ascetics before them, right? So if you read, say, the life of Antony, one of the texts you let to read in my class, You'll see that before he actually moves out into the desert, he spends some time in the city with spiritual fathers, with spiritual mentors who are themselves ascetics, perhaps living a solitary life, but within the city, within the urban context. And he puts his sister into a house of virgins, a, what we might call a nunnery today, which is anachronistic for the early 300s, but hopefully you get the idea. And we have um, evidence of such places existing back into the 200s, at least, if not earlier. So who are the Desert Fathers then if there's already asceticism? Well, what happens is people like Antony decide that this sort of, um, you know, inspiration from the Gospels to give away all they have to the poor, to de dedicate themselves to prayer and fasting in a much more systematic, serious way, isn't enough. That they des decide that their monomania for God, to be monotropes, um, to, have, to be single-minded in their devotion to God, and therefore become a monachos, a monk, a solitary, means that they need to retreat from the rest of the world. And the Greek word for this is anachoesis. Um, and so what we get happening is Antony and a bunch of other people, he's just like the most famous, kind of the first to do it, go out into the hinterland of the cities of Egypt in particular, as well as in Syria, Palestine region, um, Judea, the Judean countryside being a uh, popular place for the Desert Fathers, as well as Mount Sinai as well. All of these things going on in these places in the fourth century. And so they go off and someone like Antony goes off to be what we would call a hermit. Other people south of him up the Nile in Upper Egypt uh, is a fellow named Pacomius. And you'll get to read about his life and his rule in my class as well. Not this entire book though. This book would be like if I were teaching a course on just St. Pacomius as well. And what Pacomius does is he's not about, he's not interested necessarily in hermits, but he is interested in the common life, the koinobion, uh, synobium. And that is what, when we think monastery, what we're thinking isn't actually St. Antony, but in fact, St. Pacomius. Uh, people who live together in community, sharing together a common life. But what the monachoi um, who are in Pacomian koinonia or uh, who are living as hermits in the wilderness like St. Antony, what these people hold in common is this being monotropes for God, this cutting themselves off from normal human society, and this training the self for pure prayer. Um, that, is, that is their single passion is just to, to find God, to seek him. Um, it is a and they do this through asceticism and entering into what we today would call mysticism, mystic practices. So they, first of all, there's fasting, sparse diet, simple living. You don't keep a lot of things. So so one of the stories about uh, Serapion, uh, who was a monk at Nitria, who eventually became Bishop of Thmuis, which is near Alexandria, and um, who was a correspondent of St. Athanasius and uh, was also perhaps one of the people we might call in the orbit of St. Antony. Anyway, one of his famous sayings is he went in to visit a brother and he looked and he said, brother, I see that you have all of the wealth of the poor just sitting there on your windowsill. 
for he had many books. Now, they're not actually anti-intellectual. If you read the letters to Serapion, it's clear that he himself, I prefer actually to drink from my right hand, but there you can see the Queen's monogram. Long live the king. Um, that the point isn't owning the books, the point is possessing the knowledge. And in the life of Antony, in fact, part of the simple living is he basically becomes a walking Bible. He's so devoted to the scriptures, he basically has them memorized. And he lives them because it doesn't matter owning books. It doesn't, I mean, these are mostly, well, there's some, you can see some Penguin classics up there, science fiction, whatever. Owning these, I have more theology books off camera or a TARDIS teapot, that isn't the path to holiness. Who cares how many Bibles you own, how many Bible commentaries you own? Who cares how many of the greatest theological books ever? So you've read the whole Summa of Thomas Aquinas, the Desert Fathers that say so? You've understood it? Great. Are you engaged in contemplation of God? Are you leading a holy life? Are you becoming virtuous? These are the things that they care about. You're not interpreting scripture correctly According to them, according to men like Mark the Monk, John Cassian, you're not interpreting the scriptures correctly unless you're living the way they call you to live. So that's sort of what they're about, is this single-minded pursuit of God through prayer, through ascesis, which literally is training. It's the same word used of athletes in the ancient world. So asceticism is training. Um, through prayer, through training, and this, and generally moving out from the cities to their hinterlands, um, not to, if when we hear desert, they're not actually moving to, say, vast dunescapes or something like this isn't, uh, this isn't dune. Uh, this is places far enough from the Nile that you're past the farms, but not out into the great vast expanses where people will die because there's no water, no food. Um, but places that are wilderness, places that you couldn't necessarily farm very well, but you could grow some vegetables maybe. You can maybe do trade with local people. Yes, this is a coronation mug you can see here. Lots of different things you can do there. And so as they go and do this, beginning in the early 300s, sort of accelerates after the conversion of Constantine. They, their lives begin to get written down and their sayings begin to get written down. And... Some of them actually write stuff down themselves, and these become a great inspiration for the entire history of Christian spirituality. So, for example, this uh, Evagrius is another. You will get to read some of his works, not this volume, because it's more expensive than some other versions of, that have fewer things in them. But this guy, Evagrius, who is himself actually controversial around the year 400, he has some really important, seriously influential works um, that are influential upon both asceticism and mysticism for the entire Christian tradition for, for forever after him, basically. Um, taken up by John Cassian on the one hand, and he writes in Latin in Gaul in the, in the early 400s, in like 430s. And then also transmitted in the original Greek, sometimes under someone else's name because of controversy, as well as in Syriac and Armenian. So his teaching spreads far and wide. He is included in the Philokalia, for those of you who know what that is, the great Eastern Orthodox textbook. Some of his works are directly translated into Latin, such as the Admonicos, um, which is like uh, this amazing set of proverbs modeled on those from scripture. Um, so, so that's just an example of one of the things that's going on is guys are writing stuff down about how to be a holy life, how to watch your thoughts so as to avoid temptation, how to pray, how to focus your mind while you pray. Um, how do you pursue this sort of austere lifestyle that is nevertheless somewhat moderate, right? So like Evagrius and others talk about how you don't actually go whole hog. If you go whole hog with things like fasting, um, then something bad might might happen. You could become vainglorious. You could damage your body. There are lots of stories about people, famous people like St. John Chrysostom, who damage their bodies because of their um, excesses in asceticism. And so they try to find this moderation where you discipline the flesh, but you don't mortify, you don't destroy the flesh. You discipline the flesh in order to gain a body that you acknowledge the fact that you, the body itself is a gift from God. And so how can you use it in order to help focus your spiritual self? How do you rein in the passions and they acknowledge the fact that the passions aren't just things to do with the body, right? The passion of fornication isn't just actually fornicating. 
It is what is there are things going on inside your mind and heart and spirit that you need to tame and draw and draw in and control. And so these are the things that they're interested in. And highest of all of these is the single-minded love of God and um and a certain I want to say losing yourself in him, but not in a sort of pantheist or Hindu kind of way or Richard Rohr cosmic consciousness of Christ or whatever. Rather, losing yourself in him the way that you lose yourself in your beloved, in human terms, where you do what is called theoria, contemplation, where you think about God and the things of God, and you try to clear your mind of all else except for him, in order that you come directly into him and meet him and are yourself made like him. It is union with Christ, which is described in the Gospel of John as being what salvation is, that we may know the Holy Trinity. And we may be united to Christ, something St. Paul talks about. So this participation in the divine life is what they are seeking. And, they, and we can't do any of these things. We can't fight the demon of gluttony. We can't fight the demon of boredom. We can't fight the demon of dejection and sorrow. Without the grace of God and the power of God in our lives. And all of this is geared towards becoming more Christ-like and becoming more holy. A theopoiesis eventually becomes theosis, deification as it is talked about um, in the patristic tradition, East and West, but the ongoing tradition, of course, is today sort of seen as an Eastern thing. So this is who the Desert Fathers were. This is what they're about. Um, and they leave behind also these, um, these little sayings. Let me grab one. I already mentioned the one of, Saint, of Serapion of Clues. Well, that's, a, that's called tripping and falling. My copy of the sayings of the Desert Fathers isn't over there. Anyway, but they have these famous little um, little sayings that they say, um, such as, prayer is a struggle until your very last breath, right? Or the monk must be like the cherubim and seraphim, all I. So that's just an example of the sorts of things. And these get gathered up in the 400s after this sort of first flowering and glory of the Desert Fathers of Egypt has taken place. Um, and then through a variety of factors, the sort of next in the fifth century really got a lot of the same tradition continuing in Judea, Palestine. And of course, there, there are all sorts of other things going on that we might be a bit standoffish, rightly so perhaps, um, about today. But that doesn't mean that they're not worth studying and worth learning about um, setting aside having fun um, along the way. And so um, this, the famous names are Antony and Pacomius, I've mentioned, Evagrius. Um, but there are, there are others who come up in the sayings and lives, like there are two different or three different Makarii, guys named Makarios, and you can read about them. Besides in the sayings, there's also um, some different sets of the lives of the Desert Fathers, such as one, a thing called the Lausiac History um, by Palladius, which you would read in my course. Um, there are two guys, Barsanufius and John of Gaza in Palestine, writing letters in the era of Justinian in the 500s. So lots of stuff going on with the Desert Fathers um, for the centuries that we'll cover in my class. But why? You may be still thinking about why do I want to take them? Well, let me tell you a few things. Why did I first get in in interested in the Desert Fathers? I've been interested in the Desert Fathers since I was an undergrad. I graduated from my undergrad in 2005, so maybe 2000. Three, let's say 2002, 2003. And for me, there are a few initial things. So, for example, the temptations of St. Antony attributed to Hieronymus Bosch, available at the National Gallery um, of Canada in Ottawa, where I went to university at the University of Ottawa for my undergrad. And as you can see, this is just a delight. And uh, this was my first introduction to the Desert Fathers, was this piece of art. The Temptation of St. Anthony, where you can sort of see, you might be asking what on earth is the point? You know, my own take that I've sort of developed over the years is that this is the scene from the life of Antony as written by Athanasius that you're going to read in my course, is that these are things that are trying to distract the poor guy from praying, like a naked lady or funnel butt. You know, I want the camera to focus on funnel butt, but it won't. But there he is for you in low definition. So that was my first introduction. You sort of like, and so then when I was taking a course on pagans and Christians in the later Roman Empire, I was like, oh, here's a topic, the Desert Fathers, man. These guys are crazy. So I started reading it. And, you know, you're always drawn by that sort of story. 
also drawn in by this kind of story. Once on a Sunday, Abba Hele went to see some monks and said to them, why have you not celebrated the Synaxis today? The Synaxis being um, the gathering of, for the worship in the Eucharist. When they replied that it was because the priest had not come from the other side of the river, he said to them, I shall go and call him. But they said that it was impossible for anyone to cross the ford, partly because of the depth, but most of all because there was a huge beast at that spot, a crocodile, which had devoured many people. The father did not hesitate. At once he jumped up and rushed into the ford, and immediately the beast took him onto its back and set him down on the other side. On finding the priest at his place, he entreated him not to neglect the community of brothers. The priest, seeing that he was dressed in a rag with many patches, asked him where he had found it, saying, You have a most beautiful mantle for your soul, brother. For he was amazed at his humility and poverty. He followed Hele back to the river. As they failed to find a ferry, Hele let out a cry, calling the crocodile to him. The animal obeyed him instantly and offered its back as a raft. Hela asked the priest to climb on with him, but the priest was terrified at the sight of the beast and backed away. While he and the brothers who lived on the other bank watched, seized with dread, he crossed the ford with the beast, came ashore, and hauling the beast out of the water, said to it, It is better for you to die and make restitution for all the lives you have taken. Whereupon the animal at once sank onto its belly and died. So, that is from a text called the Historia Monocorum in Aegypto, translated as the lives of the desert fathers. Cistercian gave, gave, did this. Cistercian did this. Cistercian did Pacomius as well. They also have an Evagrius volume, not the one I held up to you. Cistercian publications. They're like my favorite monastic publisher. So that kind of story gets you jazzed. But also what gets me, got me excited when I started reading the sayings was this single-mindedness. I am the sort of person who has high aspirations even if I'm really bad at living up to them. I like to imagine that, oh yeah, the holiness that would come from a life devoted to God. The stripping away of all unnecessary things, but yeah, look at the number of Anne McCaffrey novels I own. Um, the bare simplicity, eating, just, just, you know, only good, plain, simple food to keep myself healthy and alive. Meanwhile, earlier this morning, I had a Persian, which is a Thunder Bay delicacy donut with cinnamon and with uh, strawberry icing on it. But I have these high ideals, and so I'm attracted to the Desert Fathers. And I think that having read them, I am actually better at these things than I was when I was a, the kind of guy who would guzzle a 1.5 liter Slurpee kind of guy. Um, and I definitely think that it has influenced my prayer life and that it gives me strength reading and meditating on these guys gives me strength to actually try more and uh, i do also believe that perfection is endless that's a gregory of nissa thing not a desert father's thing but it it matches well um the ideal of endless perfection as we ascend to the mount of god to paradise to find him in the cloud of unknowing on sinai so um so just sort of that endless calling and that is something that certainly attracted me as well i got my hands on a copy of early christian lives translations of some of these early monastic lives by carolyn m white it's a penguin classic and i read there the life of saint anthony way back when um when i was 20 and i uh, read this and i saw like was just so overcome with the idea of his, he, re, he goes into the church one day and he hears the verse from Matthew, go sell all you have, give to the poor, then come and follow me. And he says, that's what I'm going to do. And does it, right? And around the same time, I had been reading like St. John of the Cross and some of these other mystical guys. And I also thought that the ideal of mysticism, the idea that I could have some sort of actual direct encounter and access to God, I might mitigate that now with a bit of palimism, but nevertheless, or articulate that now with a bit of palimism, nevertheless, that was appealing, that, that called out to me. And so this bringing together of ascesis and mysticism of contemplatio, theoria, uh, that really also has always appealed to me and is the sort of thing that I wish I could be better at. And by the grace of God, someday, hopefully I will be. So if these are things that interest you, the quest for holiness, the quest for encountering God, um, 
Crazy stories about guys riding crocodiles, guys living on top of pillars, guys wearing iron undershirts, um, or the history of spirituality. How do we get to where, to like the medieval guys, the medieval guys are all rooted here in the Egyptian, Syrian, Palestinian deserts. Um, this is the course for you. So I do hope that uh, someone out there watching this video today will be encouraged to take up my video I mean, not my video, take up my course. And that's all I have for now. God bless.